Hello, my name is Christian Yubicki. I'm a robotics professor and a lab director, and I love to make robots walk and run like people. I love to make algorithms that make robots walk. I love to experiment with robots, big and small, with legs. And I love to study how animals move to get inspiration for how to make robots walk and run better. And when I tell people that I like working with robots with legs, they often ask me, why? Why, why do you want to do this? And my answer, my first answer is, because it's cool, for one. You know, these are actually the machines I wanted to build when I was a kid. These are the things I saw in science fiction and movies that I wanted to build. It was always so cool to me, and I always knew this is what I wanted to do. But in addition to that, I think that legs are critical to getting robots out in our world doing things we want them to do. I want them to be able to deliver packages to our doorstep. I want them to do chores in our homes. I want them to charge to my rescue when I'm in danger. But right now, robots are largely confined to factories where their environments are tightly controlled. Not much happens that they don't expect there. But out in our world, it's full of surprises. If a robot's rolling around, it might encounter some stairs in our cities and curbs that it has to step over. And out in the natural world, it's no better. We have mud and snow and rugged terrain that we have to hike over. We need legged robots so that way they can adapt to the environment that they are in, both in their shape with legs, but also in their behavior. We need robots that can think on their feet, literally. Okay. So as it happens, I have my own odd experience in adapting to new environments. But when I was marooned, by, voluntarily marooned, in the islands of Fiji for the TV show Survivor. Survivor is this month-long, grueling competition where you are deprived of food, you have to build a shelter, you are flung onto a tribe of strangers with whom you're competing in challenges, but also have to cooperate with. It's quite a harrowing experience. And when I tell people that I, a robotics professor, went on Survivor, people ask, why? Why? Why did you do this? And again, Survivor is incredibly cool. The whole concept is cool to me, all right? I love how they'll take someone like me, who is a robotics professor who writes algorithms for a living. This is my audition video. I send this in, and they say, this is a great idea. Let's put him on a desert island. Let's see how he adapts to that. Let's, oh. Thank you. Thank you. I wasn't wasn't expecting that. No, so, so how do I adapt to this new environment? You know, robotics professors are not trained to be on desert islands. If we are, I missed that day in robot school. But, so how would I adapt to this environment? And to me, I was actually very surprised how it all went. I used my algorithmic knowledge to solve puzzles and challenges to win things for my tribe. And I would use robotic search methods to search the island during treasure hunts to find hidden immunity idols and things that would help me in the game. So overall, I was very pleased and it underscored the importance of adaptation in my life. And furthermore, it also highlighted to me how the human experience of adapting to something new and the engineering of making robots do the same thing actually went hand in hand. So, Back to robots. What do robots need to adapt to? The first thing they need to adapt to is their own limitations. And this is particularly true of legged robots, where their primary limitation is actually the battery on their back. It just runs out of juice too fast. Most robots that walk around run out of juice in an hour or two. They just run out of power. Whereas humans can run whole marathons without stopping to refuel. So it's a big problem for robots, and they need to be able to adapt to those limitations. So me and my colleagues came up with a control algorithm that would adapt a robot's behavior to its energy limitations by making it walk as efficiently as possible. And we decided to apply this to this robot here called Duris. This is a prototype search and rescue robot for the next generation of robotic technologies. And we wanted it to walk as far as possible on as long as it can on a battery charge. So what we did is we created this control algorithm for which the first thing it would do is it would look at this robot and then derive the math equations for how it moves. Now, they were quite complicated. If you were to write them out by hand, the paper you would use would cover two football fields. 
So, yeah, wow, indeed. It's, 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 it's very complicated. Then it would take those equations and then run it through another algorithm that would take all the joints of the robot and figure out what the best possible motion was for an efficient walking motion used as little energy as possible. And when we put this on the robot and booted it up, this is what it did. It walked, okay? And not only did it walk meeting our efficiency goals for the project, it also walked quite naturally in the sense that it would stick out its foot, land on its heel, roll onto its toe, and have gravity help it lunge to the next step. Very human-like in that way. And we didn't tell it to walk like a person. The algorithm, as a consequence of adapting to its limitations, walked like a person as a consequence. Remember that for later. So the next thing that robots need to be able to adapt to are disturbances. Disturbances are anything that get in your robot's way or push your robot. You know, if you pushed me, please don't, but if you did, I would have to catch myself, right? So robots, things will surprise it, and it needs to be able to adapt to these disturbances. And this was very important for this robot we made called Atreus. Now, Atreus is this prototype, next-generation, agile, agile robotic platform. That was the purpose of it. And it was super important for us to give it control algorithms that would make it adapt to disturbances, okay? And we started off very, very simple. We started by making control algorithms that would just step in place, and we give it little disturbances, little pushes. So we did this experiment, which is one of my favorites, where we just hit Atreus with dodgeballs over, <laughs> over, over, over and over again. It's fine, it's fine, Atreus is cool. So, uh, so and it, Atreus is constantly correcting, and we eventually did knock it down, though, but we did cheat. We hit the emergency stop button. So, <laughs> so, 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 you know, if you ever need to take down the robot, emergency stop, pro tip from Dr. Hibiki. So, but this was all just a ramp up, okay, to a much more common disturbance than dodgeballs for, wa for walking robots, tripping. So Atreus is actually blind. So when we tell Atreus to walk forward, it has no idea that this platform is in its way. It's, it's a complete surprise. And yet Atreus is able to adapt whenever it stumbles on the robot, it stumbles on the obstacle. Let me show you that one again. It actually stubs its toe right on the edge there and kicks to the side and catches itself and keeps going. You know, in a lot of ways, not only is it very adaptive, that's what I like to do if I were tripping on something. I stub my toe and I put my foot out to catch myself. Human-like in another way. So another thing that robots need to adapt to are the tasks that we give it, okay? You know, robots can't just do one exact precise thing. When something happens in the world, we need them to do something new, they have to be able to adapt to that new task. And even if it's a walking robot, a walking robot can't just walk at one speed. What if we're in a hurry? What if we need to get somewhere faster? Well, we actually tried this out with our Atreus robot and our control algorithms to see how adaptive they were to increased speeds. So we took it out to this football stadium here and told it to go faster, 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 as fast as we could go. Got a touchdown, apparently. And, and we found that it actually went at a new top speed, which is good. That's what we kind of wanted it to do. But what surprised us is how it achieved that top speed. We were telling it to walk faster and faster, and we looked at the data after the test was over, okay? After the test was over, we looked at the forces on each leg, left leg, right leg, so on and so forth, and there were these little gaps in the middle there. See that? That means that there, were no for there was no force on either leg. It was in the air, meaning it wasn't walking, it was running. And in order to adapt to the task that we gave it, it ran instead much as like I would have to do if I were in a hurry, okay? And finally, I want to talk about adapting to environments. And this is a great opportunity to go back to my, to my experience on Survivor. You see, after about a week or two in the game, I had been on a tribe with people I had gotten to know. We had figured out how to work with each other. We worked together well. I knew all about them. Then all of a sudden, there's a twist in the Survivor game and they shuffled up all the tribes into new tribes. My environment was now changing. Now on my tribe was a couple of people I want to point out. Uh, one was this gentleman here. <laughs> His name is John, and he is a professional wrestler who goes, who goes by the name the mayor of Slamtown. Um, and also this man here, his name is Dan, and he is a police officer 
a SWAT team member, and in his spare time, models for the covers of romance novels. Now, now for point of comparison, this is me at the exact same time. That's what I look like. <laughs> so this was not my typical crew, right? This is not what I'm used to being around. Um, my environment had changed, right? And this is a little scary on Survivor because it's important to blend in with your tribe, okay? That's, that's one of the fundamentals of the game. So we get to talking, the three of us, and then it comes up in conversation that maybe Christian can become one of the brochachos. <laughs> the brochachos. I was curious what the brochachos were, naturally. And, and he said, well, we are a club of people that care about workouts and physical fitness and being at peak performance. I'm like, okay, this is an exciting moment for me. That's me at the time. I need to become a brochacho. I need to adapt to this new environment. So I wasted no time. I started to draft the bylaws of the brochachos. I created the constitution, uh, which involved doing pull-ups every morning, which I did. I had to climb a tree to do them, which was its own form of comedy. But we all got along really well. We became fast friends and worked together greatly. I had adapted to my environment, just as we want robots to do. So what does the robotic environment look like? Well, typically, a robot's environment is the terrain it's walking on. You know, the terrain could be this flat ground here or this carpet, or it could be out in the wilderness or out in the beaches, like sand. I got plenty of that on Survivor, that's for sure. And so I was curious, what would it be like for a robot to jump or to walk on sand. And we actually tried this out with our robot Atreus. Well, half of ro the robot Atreus. This is actually just one of the legs of Atreus instead of two. And because it only has one leg, it can just hop up and down. That's all it can do. And we were trying some early preliminary hardware tests and just to see if we can get the robot hopping up and down well. And it was doing fine. And I said, hey, what if we had it hop on some sand? Maybe it would be like a little bit of a challenge for the robot. You know, the sand would, you know, bend a little bit underneath the robot's foot. It'd be a minor challenge for our control algorithms. We'll see what happens. So we tried the test. We pushed the robot over onto the box of sand and actually plunged down all the way down to the bottom of the box, which I didn't expect. And the robot didn't expect it either. And somehow there but for the grace of this robot, it survived, luckily. Now, I took the entire process in stride. I kept. I kept my cool, and I want to point out that these photos were taken six years apart. <laughs> Guess we don't all change that much. So I was surprised, as was the robot. But the thing is, in real life, if you or I go out to the beach and we touch sand, the first time you might be like, oh, that's nice and squishy. But by the second, third, or fourth time we touch it, we're no longer surprised. We know it's soft. We have learned the terrain every time we touch it. Well, let's do that with the robot, too. Let's use some machine learning techniques to have it learn what it's touching every time it touches it, and then learn it, and then adapt for the future. It'll adapt to the terrain. So we did this with a different robot here, a different jumping robot we put on sand, and we tasked it to jump up to that line, at the little green line at the top. And every time it would jump, it would feel the ground and learn what it was jumping on and try again. And after a few jumps here, see, it jumps a little low, a little high, and just right. And it has learned what it's jumped on and how to jump on it, okay? And this is great because we can also have it jump on different things. We can take it back to hard ground, for instance. So here's a robot, that same robot hopping on hard ground. And you can see it kind of just bounces, 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 bounces like that. But what if we instead wanted to stick the landing? Well, a different task that it needed to adapt to. Well, we can do that. We can tell the robot, hey, stick the landing this time. And sure enough, boom. And you'll notice that, uh, so, <laughs> so you'll notice that, uh, so, so uh, in the, when I looked in the background, uh, so let's go back a second here. So you'll see that it stuck the landing, okay? And you know, so I noticed that when, uh, so I was very pleased with how it stuck the landing. And then when I looked in the background of this, of this jump where Michaela Maroney stuck the landing, you'll see that there was a judge there and a very particular reaction <laughs> that I feel like I can relate to. <laughs> so I've shown you a lot of ways that robots need to adapt to their environments and all the things they need to adapt to. But I hope you notice 
that when robots started to adapt better, they started to act a little bit more like us. I think that's interesting. And it makes me take a look at myself when I'm doing things in everyday life. Maybe I'm the answer to how to make robots function better. And it reminds me of something th people say about the sciences, that when you talk to an astronomer, let's say, and you ask them, why do you like astronomy? And a lot of them will tell you, the thing I love about astronomy is I can look up at the stars and see them in an entirely new way than I ever saw before. And, and it's because I understand more about what they are and how they work. And for me, with robotics, it's the same thing, except I don't look at everyday life the same way again. Everything I do, whether it's something crazy on Survivor, or just normal everyday life, or just some normal surprise I might do for no apparent reason, I'll take this tool here I use. I'm going to try to catch it. How did I do that? What calculations did I use in order to do that? Could I make a robot do that? And so I look at life in a very different way. And to me, that is really cool. <laughs> and with that, thank you all for your time. Thanks for having me.